of our planet left stone structures all over the world, leaving us puzzled and trying to work out the who's, the when's, and the why's? The reality is, places like Stonehenge and the pyramids in Egypt are just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to the extent of monuments found. How many sites have been destroyed or are yet to be discovered? Hi, I'm Dr. Rita Louise and this is Just Energy. Just Energy is brought to you by SoulHealer.com, where you can find out about all the products and services I offer. Is it possible that a civilization once inhabited the entire surface of the planet, was much more advanced than we are, both technologically and spiritually, and existed way before our current civilization began? In this episode, we'll be speaking with filmmaker Mick Hobde. Mick has climbed soil-covered pyramids and searched high and low for huge megalithic monuments in search of the existence of an ancient civilization that was both globally and highly advanced. His website, where you can find his amazing films, is modernexplorers.co.uk. So please welcome Mick Hobde. Hey Mick, how's it going? Great, how are you? I am great. I am just so honored to have you come on the show today. Um, I watched some of your videos that you have on um, uh, website, website, website. Modern Explorers. Modern Explorers. That's the one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you got it. <laughs> and, um, you know, you put out some information. I don't want to, like, spill all the beans, but you put out some information that I've never heard of before, saw before, and really want to support you and your work and getting it out there. You know, in addition, the videos were like good, <laughs> you know, well yeah, shot, well you. produced. So congratulations. Thank you very much. Yeah. I'm very pleased with them. Good. So let's start here. Let's, you know, first time on the show. So what got you interested in studying me megalithic sites so much, so much that you've traveled around the world looking at them? Honestly, I don't really know. I really don't know where it came from. I mean, talking to someone like yourself, I can say I was guided, but more or less. I mean, I started traveling initially just for my own pleasure, just to experience some variety. And, you know, traveling gives you that because one minute you're on the beach, the next minute you're in the mountains. So it was actually when I first started traveling just, just for me. But I came across so many amazing sites. I slowly got um, guided and into this kind of this topic. The megalithic stuff didn't really come till till much later. I mean, I was in Peru and saw Machu Picchu and the Nazca Lines, and then a lost city in Colombia and the the pyramids in Mexico. But the megalithic stuff came probably probably eight years into my travels. And the the one thing I remember one fact that really got me into them and that was when I heard Hugh Newman say that there are 30,000 dolmen in Korea. I just was absolutely gobsmacked by that fact and and from then on I've been looking at these dolmen and these stone circles and all these things and and the, the, where the videoing came from I've got no idea. <laughs> but we all have to do something and I appreciate that you know it's something that's coming from your heart and something that you're being led to do versus, well, I can make some money doing this and, you know, become rich and famous because I think it changes stuff. You know, it changes yeah. the whole yeah. intention of what we're doing. Well, I've not made a single penny from any of my videos, <laughs> if, I'm, if I'm totally honest with you, but it, was, it never was really something I thought about that much. I mean, we all need money, but I've always done these jobs in supermarkets and things like this to fund my travels and the filming of these sites has come coinciding with with my travels as well so i go on a trip around south africa and and i video some ancient sites and i video video some eco-friendly projects and and i also have a great time as well so um 
yeah, it's it's um, it's the videoing side of it just is me wanting to show people these things because I also, like yourself, didn't know about how many sites there are out there and, and the planet is covered in these things. It, it really is. The stone circles, dolmen, all of these the pyramids that most people will probably know about, but they probably don't know about the stone circles. I mean, like you have one, you have a few actually, I think, in the United States, in the Northeast, in New Hampshire and Massachusetts. So, I mean, I didn't find out about that until a couple of years ago even. So... It's fascinating stuff for, for me anyway. Well, and I think it's pretty amazing. And that's one of the things that I really appreciate, you know, about your work, because we know about the pyramids. We know about Stonehenge. We know about, you know, a handful of sites. But in watching your film, and we're going to get into some of the different things that you've talked about, you brought forward sites and information that, I've never heard of, and I feel like I'm pretty well read in the topic. Mm. Um, well, that was the whole point, actually. When I first sort of, because you know, I wanted to better the world, so to speak, when I started getting into this, and I didn't want to bother stepping on the footsteps of of such intellectual people that cover the pyramids in Peru and all these kind of things. Like it's been covered. I wanted to to fill the niche, so to speak, and, and tell people about, like you say, the, 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 the places and the things that the people have never heard of before. Well, how did you find some of the locations that you filmed, you know, and again, we'll get into this more, but such as the Field of Domen or the Stone Spheres of France, which I have to tell you was my favorite. Oh, really? Tell you. Yeah, mm. which we'll get into because I got questions. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but how did you find some of these locations? I mean, was it through word of mouth or, you know, I mean, because it's not something that you would necessarily just stumble upon, you know, no, no, in sure. your travels. Well, it's just something that you, you have to research. I mean, the Internet is an amazing thing and there's just you can, you know, can find anything on there. And there's some there's there's one really great website in particular that covers these megaliths that very well. And they, they cover it country by country. So it's more or less, I you know, with, with the field of Dolmen in the Middle East, for example, I wanted to go to Jordan and I wanted to video Petra. So I just look up, oh, what else do they have in Jordan? And lo and behold, there's fields and fields of these Dolmen. There's thousands of the things. So it, it's more or less like that. And then I, I try and research further and get some information about them. But pretty much it's just mainstream information, you know, there's a professor talking about such and such and how they were tombs, you know, everything's a tomb back from the day. So, so I sort of didn't really have much information to go on and would just go and film them and then and see what I could find out. And, and more, more or less my, my side of things is to show people them and then let other people do re research because when you're out in a, a field in the middle of Jordan, it's, it's um, you know, it's there's not much you can go by really. I mean, if I'm honest with you, they're, they're rocks in a field. So, you know, how, how much is there to, to, to talk about actually? But when you actually research these topics, there is plenty to talk about. Well, and I'm sure they wouldn't appreciate you out there with like a little pick and shovel and digging around in the <laughs> dirt. No, no, I wish I could, but uh, I also don't have the time for that, to be honest with you. You have to do a hell of a lot of digging to find some of the stuff, I think. Mm -hmm. But let's start and talk about the dolmen for a little bit. You know, for the viewers that aren't familiar with what a dolmen is, what's a dolmen? Okay, well, dolmen actually means, I think it's Gaelic, but it's dolmen means stone table. So it's basically some upright stones with a capstone across the top. And these come in many different shapes and sizes. I mean, some of the ones I videoed in the UK, you've just got two or three like tables of the uh, legs of the table, if you like, and then a capstone across the top. And then there's some in Poland, for example, I videoed uh, last year, and they have maybe 10 legs of the table and four capstones across the top. And they come in, they have different names. The mainstream has given them different names. I think there's Portal, Dolmen, and, and some are surrounded by a kind of cairns, which is just a mound surrounding these things. So, yeah, it's um, more or less a stone table. But as I said, they come in various shapes and sizes. And, and some, of the, some of the capstones, I think the largest one in the world is one of these ones in Korea, which is 300 tons. You know, these are, some of these things are, are, are massive. Um, but they're... 
beautiful sites. I mean, like I like to just go out and, you know, as I said, they're usually in beautiful locations and they look like sculptures, you know, so that was actually probably the thing that attracted me the most. I just like to photograph them. And well, I mean, some of the ones that I've seen pictures of, which I found very interesting, you know, there's the ones you're talking about with just the uprights and the top. But then there are some that actually have what look like a doorway, you know, like a round doorway or, you know, some kind of doorway. Mm. And, you know, my weird traveling off mine goes, well, it kind of looks like a little apartment. You yeah. Know, somebody might actually have lived in there and had that door there as a windbreak, you know, especially oh, like okay. I've seen some in Russia that look that way. Yeah. Well, those that have little circular, they're more like windows, aren't they? The ones in Russia, just like little circular holes, more or less in the front. Um, but yeah, I mean, if they're doorways, they're, they're pretty small, some of them. I mean, they're only a couple of feet tall. So if they're apartments, I don't know who was living in there, maybe little goblins or pixies or something. God knows. Well, I don't know how big they are. You know, you just see the picture and you have to use your imagination. No, of course. No, I'm just, I mean, some of them are, some of them are four foot tall, like the doorway specifically I'm talking about, but some are, some are really tiny, which again, makes you just think, what were they for? You know, I mean, like if, if. If there were, there would be more like dog kennels than, than apartments, actually. Hmm. You know, well, you don't. know, my mind could go in a lot of different places from, you know, because if they were burial sites, you know, there are a lot of ancient traditions that talk about creating a, an access so that the spirits can leave their burial place, you know, and you find that more in the Americas, you know, where they'll face mm -hmm. the burial area facing east so that they can their soul can leave and have easy access out yeah do you find yeah. and let me kind of follow up on that question or that comment do you find that these things face in any direction you know do they face east west traditionally or you know are they just kind of there no, I think they're just kind of there. I mean, talking about the fields of Dolmen in Jordan and Israel, I mean, when I was walking around there, they were all facing in different directions. So I would assume if they were kind of pointing towards Mecca or whatever their equivalent was back then, then they would have all been going in the same direction. But there's, there's, it's hard to find any consistency with with not only the dolmen but all of these megalithic sites i mean all of the circles around the world are all different shapes and sizes same for the dolmen so i'm, I'm not sure exactly that the that they are pointing towards a spe spe specific direction but i could stand corrected on that i'm sure so for many who are aware of dolmens i think the traditional belief is that they're primary found primarily found in england and northern europe you know, but you were talking about, what, 30,000 of them in Korea, which is mm -hmm. amazing. Mm -hmm. um, what, and, and you've talked about Jordan. But what other unlikely locations have Dolmen been found? Well, I mean, it's, it's, they found them in Colombia, China. You have some Dolmen-type structures in, again, New Hampshire, and they cross the border into Canada. They've been found in, I videoed, my, my very first video that I made was some dolmen-like structures in Tunisia. So they're, they're really found all, all over the place. I mean, India as well, just to pluck a few off, but you know, I think Pakistan has some. So they're pretty much dotted all around the world. But the ones in Colombia and in China, they're so ruined that it's hard to say exactly that they're dolmen. And that's the problem with dolmen as well. I mean, I videoed quite a few in France and went to visit some of them and you just turn up and it's, it, it could literally just be a few rocks. So these, these things, because you, it's obviously a weak structure, you know, you've got the capstone and then that can easily fall, especially if we're talking about, I mean, they're officially 5,000 years old, but I would suggest that they're a lot older than that. So um, a lot of them are really quite degradated and, and ruined, believe it or not. Well, the part I find interesting is that they're found all over. You know, if mm. they were created by a singular culture, then they would, they would be geographically located. And so having them be in one, you know, in England or in that area would show a cultural consistency. But mm -hmm. the fact that they're found around the world says that there's some, to me, that there's something bigger going on. Well, that's exactly why I 
also found the megalith so interesting because it's the same for the stone circles. I mean, as I said, you've got a few in the United States. They're found in India. They're found in South Africa. I mean, they're kind of decorated all over the place. I've got some maps on my website and it shows how the standing stones are spread out, the dolmen, the stone circles, stone spheres also. You've got them in Costa Rica, in Bosnia, in, in Russia, same as the pyramids. They're dotted all over. So that for me was the, 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 the biggest pointer towards the fact that there could have been a global civilization in our past. You know, this whole ancient aliens, ancient civilization field is, um, is, is a fascinating one. But for the, to prove that they were older and to prove that they had technology is not my speciality. You know, you need engineers and this kind of thing. But being a traveler, I was able to show that, you know, these things are definitely global for sure. Well, that they exist in the first place because so many people have their little blinders on and go, no, 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 it's just here and mm. showing the vastness. You know, like in my work, I look at the mythological record and my, my soapbox is, you know, we have a global historic narrative. That's, mm -hmm. that's my soapbox. And mm. so I find that your findings support that commentary, because if you're finding parallels in the archaeological record, you know, megalithic or not, it doesn't really matter, of uh, these common elements around the world, it supports, again, this notion of a global civ civilization that we have no clue of. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, definitely. I mean, and uh, I don't pay attention too much, much to mythology, but... There's some great work done by David Talbot and the Electric Universe. I'm sure you've heard of that guy. Mm -hmm. I mean, his work connecting the dots and, and drawing similarities between all of the legends over the years is um, fascinating stuff, really. And I completely agree with what you say. It's the, the fact that it's global was just a big, like, slap in the face for me a few years ago. And again, it's like the reason why I wanted to start videoing these things and, and trying to show people how much there is out there. And it, it seems like there's a lot, you know, so I, you mentioned the date of, you know, 5,000 years or 5,000 BC, um, for the dating of the dolmen, um, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm going to kind of take it in a different place, you know, cause I'm friends with, you know, and I always say his name wrong, but you know, doc, Dr. Sam Osminagash, however you say oh, his yeah. last name correctly, mm -hmm. you know, from the, the, the Bosnian pyramid fame. You know, and in his work, he has dated based on radiocarbon dating of some organic material that they found sitting on the outside of the pyramid as they were digging down to like 28,000 BC, something mm -hmm. like that. Do you think that these dolmen could be that old? Do you think they could have survived that long on the planet? Oh, for sure. I mean, I think, so. I mean, some of the ones I saw in France were so ruined and degradated that I, I mean, I don't want to put numbers on it because I don't really know, but I just, you, you go and you visit these things and you just think that's not 5,000 BC, you know, that's not 7,000 years old because they're just, they're just crumbled and falling to pieces. And, um, you know, I, I mean, like the, how that they date these things by, they find, you know, ceramics or they find some little bits of bone around these, these, you know, these dolmen or these standing stones or circles. And I don't really know exactly how they can say that that is the remains from the builders. I mean, if I always say in some of my videos, you know, if, if our civilization was wiped out tomorrow and another civilization in 5,000 years time was looking at Stonehenge and they found a can of Coke, they think that the Stonehenge was from now, you know, they think that we built it now. So I really believe that these dolmen were used by later civilizations. I mean, like if, if they were, say, 30,000 years old, the same time as the pyramids in Bosnia, and then there was this big uh, cataclysm with the Ice Age, you know, when the Ice Age ended and all this kind of thing, then why wouldn't a civilization in 5000 BC or cavemen or whoever these people were just see these dolmen and think, I'm going to live inside it, you know, create an apartment, like you said. I mean, I would. I definitely would. So, um, yeah, I, I would think from having seen what I've seen of these sites, I, I have to say that they are, I would think that they are a lot older than 7000 years old. But to put a number on it, I have no idea. Well, and 
in the same way that we go to the pyramids of Egypt or go to Stonehenge, you know, I could see where our ancestors might pack a picnic lunch and have that be a travel destination where they go to to check out this stuff that's mm -hmm. so old. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And also, I mean, these the, there's theories about these being a connection to the to the spirit world as well. So why wouldn't somebody go there to die you know if you if you knew that you were going to die and you wanted a safe passage to the to the next next realm or the next life it's highly possible that you would you know like you say take a picnic and a bottle of whiskey or something and go and sit in a dolman and uh, go out in style so to speak so no it's totally possible could you speak on that for just a second about the connection to the connection with the spirit world okay well on personal experience with these megalithic sites, I have had experiences that believe me to can to that make me believe that there is a connection to higher vibrations, higher realms. I mean, I've had some fascinating meditations while touching some of these stones. Some of my guidance has been to go and touch certain stones. So I actually believe, and I've met plenty of people around these sites who also believe that there is definitely a connection to the spirit world. I mean, some stone circles I just videoed in Poland last year, there was uh, many stories of spirits in the trees and um, spirits from other dimensions guarding the stone circles and all this kind of thing. So the connection between uh, these sites and people reaching higher vibrations or realms or spirit world, whatever you want to call it, it there is a strong connection there. And most people who go to visit these sites are believers of this kind of way of thinking, including myself. <laughs> do you think? <laughs> do you think it's because of the materials that the dolmen are made out of? You know, we talk about the king's chamber in the Great Pyramid being out of quartz, you know, out of granite, um, mm. creating a resonance and a vibration based on the material, the material that these dolmen are made out of, do you think that that's part of what's going on? Or do you think it's more the land, that there's a, a ley line, or that this was at some point in time a sacred site, and that's why we find the dolmen there? Or both? I think, I think both, actually. I was going to say, I mean, one thing I've noticed, you know, you, you, when you visit these sites and when you visited so many, you look for similarities between them. And in terms of the structure, as I said, there's a lot of variation. But one thing I do notice a lot is the high level of crystals in these things. I mean, everywhere I go, there's there's sometimes it's just little little crystals embedded in there. Sometimes there's one stone in particular that just looks like a giant crystal that but there's always, always a high. Well, not not 100% of the time, I'll be honest, but there's generally speaking a high level of crystals in these in these stones. So I think that definitely these were built and chosen to have these, you know, this high level of crystal in there. I also think that they are positioned in terms of the Becker Hagen's grid and, and they are positioned in certain places to be able to absorb certain energies that are running through the ground. And I wouldn't be at all surprised if there was a connection between the two, because these crystals, you know, crystals have a piezoelectric effect where if you put them under pressure, they release electricity. And um, so I wouldn't be surprised if these ley lines were interacting with these crystals in some way to give out some some form of energy. And, and this is a well-documented thing, you know, without without crystals, we wouldn't have microchips and we wouldn't have watches. And in fact, all of our technology has has crystals involved in it. So, um, yeah, for sure, I think that these most of these sites, not 100 percent of them, but most of these sites who were, that were built by the original builders have been put in a certain place and they've chosen a certain type of stone to to do something which as i said i think is is to do with energy and a connection to the to the higher realms is do we find a similar kind of material a high crystalline structure material in things like the standing stones the the mayors and the stone circles yes 
Yeah, you do. Yeah, it's all of the megalithic sites I've, I've visited. I mean, there's in the, the film I made about the, the megaliths in the Spanish Pyrenees, the, where we did the introduction, there is this standing stone that's probably a, a little bit taller than myself, and it has this massive line of crystal going through. It looks like a V. And um, so there's this massive crystal in it. Then one of the stone circle complexes I visited in Poland, most of the stones had crystals in them, but there was one in particular, which I video at the end of the film, which was on the way to the toilet, actually. But this, this looked like it had so many crystals in there. I think it was more or less just one giant crystal. So they're associated with circles, meneers, dolmen, I think also long barrows as well, like all of these megalithic sites that have um, stones with crystals in them. Again, the, the Poland trip, there's there's one stone, which is just, it's a beautiful thing. And I, we've spent some time like around this thing because it's got layers. It looks like, um, it's like, like a circular shape, but it's just got these layers of crystals like going through it. And it's um, it looked like it was positioned in a certain place, like specifically to do something, which uh, again, I'm not exactly sure what, but um, something to do with energies, I'm sure. But that's really cool. Um, mm. But it also is a testament to the builder's knowledge of stone. You know, not the construction part, but the selection of stone and that there was something potentially deeper going on. I mean, why would you go through all of the trouble of finding a stone with a high crystalline structure to put it in there if it was just a burial chamber? Of course, yeah. And some of the time they, they get these stones from hundreds of miles away. You know, Stonehenge is the most famous one. Where, you know, they've taken those stones from Wales for a specific reason. And I haven't found, that's probably the greatest distance I've seen stones actually carried. But they're usually taken from other parts of, you know, other hills or other valleys or this kind of thing. So it, it is like they have gone to an area and said right okay we need a certain level of crystal and maybe a certain like uh, percentage of elements in the rocks and they've said oh, okay we're five miles away there's something like that let's go and get it kind of thing you know so yeah for sure and then they have to transport it you know we sit here and talk about moving the blocks of the pyramids um but you know technically they didn't even have rope you know, <laughs> they didn't have anything. You know, they barely had bows and arrows, depending on where you're talking about in history or prehistory. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and some of the stones that they that they've moved are absolutely gigantic. I mean, the biggest two in the world is one in Baalbek in Lebanon which is this, um, it's basically it's a standing stone, a single block that's 1,200 tons, similar to the one that's found in Aswan in, in Egypt. And, you know, that's, that's a, such a heavy kind of figure, it's hard to put it in perspective, but like, I looked up on, in one of my films, I looked up how, how much a 747 weighs, and that weighs 80 tons. When you take out the, the cargo and it, all the people, a 747 weighs 80 tons. So we're talking about a rock that actually is like 15 747s compacted into one. And then, like you say, they drag these with rope and they on, on, you know, trees and these kind of things. They rolled it along the ground. And sometimes they go uphill as well. There's a place in Peru called Ayan Tetambo. And they've built these megalithic structures like halfway up a hill. And they've taken the, the, the quarry is down into a valley and up the other side of a hill. So they've come down and then up again. So it's not like they just roll them along. They've actually gone against gravity, which when, you know, it's not an easy thing to do, move a 60 ton stone if you haven't got a crane or some kind of technology. I mean, there is the Thunderstone in Russia where they put uh, a sculpture of Peter the Great you know, so I mean, it's famous. If you saw it, you would know what I was talking about. And that, like, apparently the biggest stone that in modern history has ever been moved. Um, <clears throat> so it outweighs the stone at Baalbek, you know, but it was done in like the 1800s, 17, 1800s, and they made a rail to move it, and they did all of this stuff to move this stone. And it took them like nine months to move it six miles. Really? How, do you know how much that weighs? Uh, it was like a hundred and. 20 tons it was big right i, I don't have the it, it's been a while since i wrote an article about it but uh, right right i understand you know, but it was it was huge and they were carving it along the way so it was getting lighter <laughs> and lighter but it still took them 
like nine months to move it six miles. And, you know, we're like, oh, you know, those Egyptians put a new stone in place every 20 minutes. It's like, mm. eh, maybe not so much. <laughs> yeah, no, there, there was um, a video I put in, uh, again, one of my films about, uh, there was a, a French group of archaeologists who tried to recreate how they would have made some of these sites. And they made this standing stone and they made a dolmen and the, the, both of them were tiny. And you've got footage of them like like just pulling these things along and there's a team of like 20 people and this thing, this thing was probably like a fifth of the ton or something you know and we're talking about like i said the the biggest dolmen the, the capstone in korea the biggest dolmen is 300 tons i mean this is how to move that and and often these are on top of hills you know and and, and to lift it up on top of some some legs is I personally can't look at the official story that they tell us and explain it at all. So that's why I have another way of thinking, I guess. But I think there's more and more people that look at this material and go, mm, something's not right. Yeah. And there's a lot of material now that the, the with the internet, we're managing to collect together all this information and there is so much out there. I mean, you look at the, the drill holes in Peru now, I'm not sure if you've seen those, but Brian mm -hmm. Forrester has shown these amazing, like perfectly circular drill holes going through like these granite, granite stones. And Christopher Dunn has, you know, he's an engineer and he's shown how the, the, the cemetery that of some of these faces in Egypt is just perfect, you know? And he, he talks about how difficult it would be to do it with laser technology. And and th th there's so much evidence now to, to, to suggest and, and that, you know, there was something else going on and, and make people go, wow, that it's, they're getting inundated with it. Mm -hmm. Exactly. In your film, Field of Dolmen, you present a really sad truth that the ancient sites, such as the one you found in Jordan, aren't being preserved. You know, why? Why not take care of them? I guess it's, just, it's, it's, all, it's all just money related and, and people don't care about them, I guess. I mean, the ones I videoed in Jordan were in, um, you know, this was only about 30 kilometers from the Syrian border. Obviously, they've got a lot of other things to worry about to be honest with you. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. um, and to, to the people like town mayors and, and these kind of people, there's just a load of rocks in a the field. They don't pay attention to them. So I guess it's a lack of understanding, a lack of caring, people too busy living the, the modern, their modern life. I mean, even the, the pyramids, uh, were, you know, were almost destroyed by the Islamic culture a, a few times, weren't they? Because they just don't care about them and they just want to destroy things and create new things and luckily we have certain organizations around the world that do preserve these um, these these sites but not enough there's, there's plenty of places i go to and and you could do anything you like to them and people do you know i've been to dolmen in turkey and there's graffiti all over them and, and these kind of things and again these people just either don't care or they don't realize how important these these structures are i guess I mean, that's right up there where they are destroying, there are groups of people destroying some of the antiquities in Iraq, you know, and mm -hmm. you see the footage and I just, I mean, I just want to cry and yeah. smack them. Well, there's a lot of secrets. <laughs> I think there's a lot of um, secret artifacts and things in Iraq that would, again, open our minds a little bit, you know, the Baghdad battery is quite a famous one isn't it but i'm sure there's you know this was mesopotamia and where samaria was so i'm sure there's a hell of a lot of interesting things that they want to cover up and destroy and yeah it's, it's sad and like you say you want to go and s slap these people they're like children playing naughtily in the corner of a room you know <laughs> <laughs> exactly <laughs> That's Mick Hobde. His webpage is modernexplorers.co.uk. And thank you for watching this portion of our interview with Mick. If you're enjoying today's programming, please click on the button below and subscribe to our channel. If you want to hear this interview in its entirety, become a Just Energy Radio insider at justenergyradio.com and access full shows commercial free and gain access to our over 10 years of show archives. And don't forget to share this episode with your friends on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. So until next time, I'm Dr. Rita Louise. This is Just Energy.